So uh, the basic crux, I'll, I'll give you the basic concept of genetics in psychiatry and, and how it is studied and all. And uh, then we can discuss specifics if we have time. See, initially, uh, the way genetics was studied was Mendelian inheritance, right? And what do we mean by Mendelian inheritance is that... Uh, is that it was either autosomal dominant or it was autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive. Um, give, give me an example of an X-linked recessive type of autism. Hemophilia? No, X Sorry, X-linked um, type, yeah, type of autism. Red syndrome. This is a favorite uh, question by the for the college. Excellent, uh, excellent uh, type of autism is is red syndrome. Okay, so essentially, what what we need to remember is initially people thought that you know psychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, are also transmitted in a Mendelian form of inheritance, and that is autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. X link or something like that. Then they could not find out any such um, candidate genes. No such candidate genes exist, uh, which tell us that you know um, this particular gene is responsible for autism, or uh, or this particular gene is the only single single gene which is responsible for anxiety or depression. And that's why then the concept changed to polygenic inheritance and what we mean by polygenic inheritance is that um, multiple genes play a role in the inheritance of psychiatric disorders okay then people used to think that it was only genetics and that also was eventually refuted because no particular gene was found to be a sure shot that you know if you have this gene then you'll have this disorder nothing such was found as far as psychiatric or mental health disorders are concerned. So then came the concept of epigenetics. And what we mean by epigenetics is it is the study of the genes and their interaction with the environment and how that interaction manifests in the form of a disease or in the form of a disorder is the entire study of epigenetics. So in, in the life of a neuron, what happens essentially in the life of a neuron is initially there is selection From the stem cells, a particular cell is selected to uh, then it migrates to the neural tube, right? It migrates to the particular area of the CNS or the central nervous system, and then there is differentiation. Then it differentiates into the neuron. After differentiation, there is uh, you know the normal life cycle, so the development, uh, the development, the apoptosis, the cell loss, cell death. Eventually, it there is cell death. So after this, this entire process is essentially has has a lot of enzymes, has a lot of uh, proteins, has a lot of receptors. There's a lot of biochemical processes which are going on, isn't it? And these biochemical processes are the ones which are genetically encoded. These are encoded by... For what might be going Sorry. Is there is there a doubt? Okay. 
so these these processes are essentially encoded genetically right and when these processes have or genetic encoding of these processes has have uh, problems or have issues then these are small pathologies and only the existence of these small pathologies only existence of these small uh, pathologies does not mean that the person is going to have depression or anxiety or schizophrenia it is when these pathologies are combined with environmental stressors and these environmental stressors in the form of difficult childhood right or um, poor upbringing or exposure to substances or um abuse abuse in any way so these are the environmental stressors which uh which in an already uh so to say weak or genetically vulnerable population and that's why when when we say that uh, you know some people can tolerate certain stressors some people cannot tolerate certain stressors so when this vulnerability is is genetic vulnerability is paired with environmental stressors then what happens is either there is unsuccessful decompensation right so whenever we are in stress say whenever we are in stress because of an exam we have cortisol which gets released in a particular amount to help us cope with that stress but what happens in certain genetically vulnerable people is that there is unsuccessful decompensation or there is reduced activation and this essentially leads or manifests in the form of a cluster of symptoms and these clusters of symptoms are essentially disorders that we study in the form of dsm or icd right um now examples of this would be misbinding right disbinding is essentially a protein uh, which which is hampered in bipolar as well as schizophrenia then you have disc 1 disc 1 is essentially uh, a, a a protein which is um which is pathological in schizophrenia uh, present on chromosome number 1 then you have uh, neuregulin um then you have uh, dtp see these are all essentially the names of proteins or the name of uh, specific components of this entire process uh of of the neuron which goes all the way from selection to migration to differentiation to death now ideally for exam point of view you would want to be conceptually clear as to what the function of this binding is what the function of this one is what the function of neuregulin is because till then we won't really understand how exactly it is it works and how exactly pathological is it but not only is it out of bounds for the exam because they won't ask you the normal function of this binding or this one uh, not only that it is also something which is still a lot in research and lot abstract so you can't really we don't really have the right answers for that as well so what you need to remember as far as the genes are concerned you need to have those in your rote memory you know the number of the chromosome number like neuregulin is present on chromosome number 8 um you have the um, uh cont gene which is present on chromosome 22. number 21 uh, 22 uh, sorry yeah um yes 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 i'm sorry on 22 and that's why um you know you have higher chances of dementia and down syndrome as well um you for, for dementias you also need to remember the chromosome number for presenilin um presenilin and i don't really remember the exact chromosome number Can anyone tell me? Presenilin two is chromosome one. 
reason i live yeah. to not very sure one is 18 if i'm not wrong then no, no, that is, is prison alien 2 wrong. yeah ha ah, prison alien 2 is chromosome 1 and 1 is 18 there yeah and then you have uh, mao so these are essentially usually the uh, the, the what do you say the genes which are asked and there is no uh, conceptual thing behind it which you can unfortunately understand and then remember these have to be in your rote memory unfortunately but the concept of epigenetics is something that you need to know for you know understanding how exactly genetics work in um in, in schizophrenia or in um, bipolar or in depression so what essentially will happen is that um if this is your brain right and uh, in, in a person with schizophrenia, you essentially have the, uh, the, the mesolimbic pathway, which is hyperfunctioning, and uh, the mesocortical pathway, which is hyperfunctioning, right? Yes. And, and that hyperfunction will lead to the executive problems or the cognition problems or the affective symptoms which are known as the uh -huh. negative symptoms and the, the positive symptoms will be because of the mesolimbic pathway right. and so when you give the rtns therapy or the deep brain yeah. stimulation therapy what you essentially do is you give the anode to this end uh, sorry you give the cathode to this end and you give the anode to this end so what you do is you want to stimulate the pre prefrontal cortex and that stimulation of prefrontal cortex will help you cure the negative symptoms or help with the negative symptoms and the um, and when you attach the cathode to the mesolimbic pathway which is as it is hyperactive it will reduce its activity and that will essentially help you with the reducing the positive symptoms or the hallucinations does does that make sense so far yes yes okay. so regarding regarding genetics is, is there anything specific that that you want to discuss what do they expect us to know for genetics do they expect yeah. us to memorize the um, disorder and also the chromosome yeah. number for exam? Yes. Yes. Um, so for for basic ones like the COMT, the MAO, the presenilin 2, presenilin 1, they might ask you the chromosome numbers. They might ask you the chromosome number for disc 1. They might ask you the chromosome number for neuregulin disbinding. Uh, but but they won't really ask you the chromosome numbers for very rare genes in the form of you know something which uh, which is still under research. If if you know these these many the ones that I've written right now, take a screenshot of it or something. I I don't think they ask a lot of uh, chromosome numbers outside this as such. But for these these many, I think you do need to remember. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Sir, I have um, a question. Anything else, Rita? Yes, please. Yeah, um, there's some calculations involved, right, in molecular genetics. Like um, the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, it was asked in the SPMM question. Are they yeah. like of any importance? Like, I find it difficult to understand. So, the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, they haven't really asked any. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't really asked the uh the equation in the exam so far i think uh, and specifically when you're preparing for paper a you don't have any calculations or any mathematical equations in your paper a they might ask some biostatistics in paper in paper b but they don't really ask a lot of uh, calculations or any mathematical equations as such in paper a right the hardy weinberg equilibrium uh, the the equation they might ask so just memorize that equation, but you don't need to definitely, you, you won't be asked any calculations as such. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you don't need to worry about doing any calculations in paper right okay thank you sir thank you sir. any other questions uh so can you explain a bit about the endophenotypes like oh the simplified version yeah uh, sh sure so uh, what what is essentially endophenotypes can anyone tell me yes sir nikola ha sir hu bas par hal the thodu chalu chhe हमने तो कोड करते थे हम आप पहले पेपर इनो डिस्कस करो थोड़ा ये ऑनलाइन पर है ना यस हेलो या एम आई ऑडिबल या या यस सो कैन एनीवन टेल मी जस्ट योर बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ व्हाट एन एंडोफिनोटाइप इज या बाय अ इट इज अ जीनोटिप जीनोटाइप which is a risk factor for the disease particular disease this one got one or it is just a factor which will indicate the risk of developing a disease in an individual it could be genes or it could be yeah okay so that for sir so you think that so i'll what what i'll do is i'll explain it with with an example so that might be easy to understand right so in patients with ocd uh, what what is found is that they have a high rate of anusita vedra patadi conflict valima yeah okay and error detection they have uh, problems with inhibiting oh, responses Right. And they have problems with set shifting. Alright. Okay. So, people who have obsessive compulsive disorder, or even the people who are related to people who have OCD. they have been found out to have increased conflict or error detection rates so when they are looking at say a piece of paper they they will uh, consciously or subconsciously look for errors a bit more than other people they have troubles with inhibiting response and this in ocd terms is very easy to understand that they cannot resist the urge or urge to not wash their hands uh and and they usually have troubles with set shifting and by set shifting the easiest way to understand that is constant shifting your focus from one thing to another so like if someone tells you count from 1 to 10 and in the very next moment he asks you to name all the letters of the english alphabets again go back to counting this essentially is is a task where you are shifting your attention from one topic to another topic very rapidly isn't it so that is an example of set shifting so these are essentially also known as the soft signs and by soft signs these are not sure shot signs of a person who has ocd but these signs are found to be on in higher prevalence among people who are either have ocd or are related to people who have ocd these are essentially known as endophenotypes these are essentially subtle phenotypes genotype is the bio biochemical or the biological constitution and phenotype is essentially the manifestation of the genetic content and when we say endophenotype what we essentially mean is that there are certain characteristics which are inherited and which are found to be on the higher side amongst people who have certain mental health disorders like another example of endophenotype is with people who have schizophrenia or the people who have first degree relatives of people with schizophrenia they usually have problems with executive functions and the simplest example of executive function is making a shopping list
or plan your day these are essentially executive functions 